Hi folks. So we're ending the course with this absolutely massive topic, but as you've seen, I've broken it down into several shorter videos, um, video lectures that will hopefully help make it a bit more accessible. And then when we're in together in the classroom environment, we'll be looking at some more casts that will hopefully illustrate some of the points I wanted to go over. But I'll apologize in advance because it means that I'll be skipping through some of these slides because they're already addressed with um, in, in other videos that I've posted. So today we're going to be talking about, in this week to wrap up the term, about the homonyms. And so I thought I'd better begin by showing you um, how we're classified and again how we are related to um, and where our shared points of ancestry are with uh, the other living primates, particularly uh, the other great apes. And so you'll see when we refer to uh, homonyms, what we're talking about is the tribe that includes uh, not only members of our genus, the genus Homo, but as we'll see in this first video, um, members of the Australopithes and Artipithecus as well, which are ancestral uh, genera to two anatomically modern humans. And then in the next video, we'll look at the genus Homo and some of the earliest members working our way towards uh, anatomical modernity or us. So again, key term that we're going to be using for this topic is that of hominins. And again, just remember that it's not just us, modern or contemporary humans, but our ancestors, including other species that um, share an ancestry with us, but seem to have branched off of our lineage and are what we kind of consider to be evolutionary dead ends in that uh, they don't have any um, antecedent species that are derived from them. Now, I already mentioned this in the context of primate evolution that we're not exactly um, sure who the earliest hominin is, uh, and, uh, but I'm gonna show you who some of the potential candidates are. And part of the reason why we have this issue is just simply because as one would expect, uh, the earliest hominin is going to look very ape-like. So the, the question becomes, how ape-like can you be um, and still become classified as a hominin? So what are the traits then that we use to, to identify what a hominin is? Well, the main trait that we use are those that are associated with bipedalism. And so I posted a little video walking you through some of the anatomical traits uh, that uh, are indicators of bipedalism. Uh, and it, this is because habitual bipedalism is something that is unique to us as humans. And so it's one of the things that we've kind of focused in on in order to identify someone as being one of our ancestors. Uh, we also see changes to the face, teeth, and jaws. Again, uh, it's now it's not about just those traits that are specific to primates that have impacted that, but again, the specific adaptations that we have as hominins uh, that reflect the different environments and diets uh, that we are adapting to. A really big thing, um, again, as I already alluded to in terms of primate evolution, is a further increase of that brain size to body size ratio. We refer to this process of the enlarging of the brain as encephalization. Again, we don't go into it in too much into this course, but the key thing to note that it's not just that the brain becomes larger, but key areas of the brain become larger, uh, particularly areas in the frontal cortex uh, that are associated with uh, a lot of behavior uh, that we see in modern humans. So not only the development of language, for example, so we see development of the language centers, uh, but other things relating to symbolic practices, creative thought, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we start to find in the archeological record that's associated with these hominins, um, really clear signs of cultural behavior, particularly that of the use of tools. So we're gonna be looking at stone tools as well as part of this. So um, I have a bit of a review in the notes, and again, in the bipedalism video, we talk about this, but we've talked about these various patterns of locomotor, locomotor behavior uh, that primates use to get around. Uh, and so what we're focusing on for this topic is the uniqueness of habitual bipedalism that's practiced by, or obligate bipedalism that's practiced by humans. So please do review these. And again, it'll be a great opportunity to kind of review some of the various uh, primates as well. So again, we focus in on bipedalism. And again, here's the link to that video. Uh, because it is something that is unique to us as, as hominins. And so we have a, a number of key traits that I would like you to focus on. And then in the video, I also talk about some of the adaptive advantages that this has, as well as disadvantages or costs uh, that bipedalism has had on us as humans as well. The other background video that I provide relates to this, which is dating techniques. Uh, and so I've provided um, two instructional videos on this one that's a, a longer piece on dating techniques in general. I'd like you to focus on radiocarbon dating or radiometric techniques and stratigraphy. Um, and so I also have a video relating to stratigraphy and how it works. 
Um, but one of the key things I just want you to consider is that one of the issues we have with um, hominin evolution is the immense time range, right? Potentially going back to 10 million years ago. Um, not all of our dating techniques, radiocarbon dating for, in particular, doesn't allow us to, uh, to get back at dates that far. So one of the limitations we have in terms of understanding this early fossil record is how do we date them? And in particular, we can't directly date the fossils in most cases. So we're looking at context and that's why stratigraphic dating becomes really critical. And again, I posted a little video uh, about stratigraphy and walking you through an exercise relating to it um, that you can take a look at as well. Um, and note that while we don't use radiocarbon dating for the majority of hominin sites, well, we do for those associated with members of our species, um, the principles that it operates under, basically that of radiometric decay or half-life dating, um, it is the same uh, for, for many of the methods. So please watch this video where I explain how radiometric decay works and uh, Olivia provides um, uh, a guest lecture instruction uh, or some demonstration purposes in that video for you folks as well. Okay, but let's get into the meat of things. A couple of quick abbreviations when I refer to MYI, I mean millions of years ago, KYA thousands of years ago. So again, we're dealing with quite an immense scale like we saw with primate evolution overall. And then just another note as well that it's not just simply that we're attempting to identify uh, the species uh, that these uh, fossil remains belong to, but uh, there are questions we ask about the individual itself because we do want to get at uh, not only the range of variation that exists, um, but also at what the lived experience of these individuals was, what it was like for, for our earliest ancestors. So, uh, for example, we do sex estimation. Uh, we look at age estimation. We can calculate what their stature is or their height or their overall build. And we can look at also metrics of their health as well to construct an osteobiography or a history of the bone or story of the bone that will allow us to understand a little bit more about, about that individual. So when we're engaging in classification, uh, we have to ask some basic questions. Uh, first and foremost, should this individual be considered to be a hominin? And again, this is mostly where we're going to look at those skeletal traits associated with bipedalism. Um, once we've determined whether or not they are hominin or not, we also have to consider whether or not they belong to an existing species or genera that we already have, or if they should be uh, placed into a new one. Um, and this process have results in a lot of rigorous debates. And again, as I've mentioned in class and previous contents, is actually, I think this is a good hallmark of science, right? That people are critically thinking and assessing uh, what the fact that fossils are is, uh, right? Uh, and again, a part of the reason why we do these osteobiographies is we want to know what these variations mean. Are we simply looking at um, an individual and some of the individual unique traits that they have as a product of their unique lineage and their environmental responses? Um, or are we looking at, again, uh, someone who represents a, a new species, right? And so this uh, is, again, an ongoing debate in anthropology. Uh, and again, we also do want to know a little bit about their lives. So the question I want you to think about as well as we, as we go through these is why might classification be so difficult? And again, we talked about this in class in the context of primate evolution as well and some of the broader issues with the archaeological and fossil record. So. As I mentioned that when we look at primate evolution, specifically the evolution of apes or hominoids, the fossil record is uh, predominantly found in Africa. And so that's why we have looked for uh, the hominin fossil record in Africa. And indeed, uh, this test has holded up that, or this hypothesis or this theory has holded up that we do have an African origin. So this map is just showing you distribution of some of this early um, hominins that we are going to be looking at. Uh, in this class. And we're going to begin with someone I brought into uh, class last Friday, which is Sahelanthropus chadensis. Uh, it's so far one of the best candidates as a potential early hominin. But what we see is a combination of traits that are potentially indicative of bipedalism packaged with overall a very apey looking individual. And again, this should be what we should anticipate, right, for an early hominin is someone or, or species that has a lot of ape-like characteristics however, has some of these key hallmarks of being a hominin. Uh, six to seven million years ago is far too early for culture. Uh, we don't see that appear until much later. Now, 3.5 million years is our earliest uh, known dated uh, stone tool sites that we have, also African. Um, but uh, so Sahel anthropus chadensis is potentially one of these early candidates for the earliest hominin. 
uh, because some of the indicators of bipedalism are potentially there. Um, because we don't have anything postcranial, these are cranial traits we're looking at, and particularly position of the foramen magnum, which I highlight in the video as being a critical trait that essentially means that we see a shift towards more upright posture, which is more indicative of bipedalism versus it being located towards the back of the skull, suggesting quadrupedalism. Um, and it's been suggested that this might be potentially our LCA uh, or our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. And, and this is supported by the genetic evidence that suggests that we likely branched off from chimpanzees and share a last common ancestor with them somewhere in between uh, nine to five million years ago. So this uh, fossil fits in perfectly with this understanding. Uh, another candidate we have that dates to a little bit more recently is a Warren II genensis or the Millennium Man uh, who comes from Western Kenya. In this case, we have not only fragments of the cranium, but also some postcranial remains. So this, for example, is part of the femur here. So we've been able to look at this postcranial anatomy um, and what we see is that, yeah, is that the species has some potential indicators of bipedalism, but also things like really long curved finger bones that are more indicative of brachiation. So uh, a, a potential candidate as a, of an early hominin, but uh, the jury is still out as to whether or not uh, this individual or the species and genus should be included in um, our understanding. When we get to the genus Artipithecus, here is where we have pretty conclusive evidence of bipedalism. We have now a couple of sites that have members of this uh, genus represented, um, including the near complete skeleton already, which a couple of years ago was declared to be Time Magazine's like fine, scientific find of the year. Uh, we have some great um, evidence as well um, of their environment. So we've been able to do environmental reconstruction that shows that Artie was indeed living in an arboreal environment, a wooded environment, but more lightly wooded, so not the kind of dense forest cover. Um, and so this would help explain why we have now uh, a genera where we have a combination of both clearly bipedal traits, but also with some retention of some arboreal or ancestral primitive traits or primate traits, sorry, not primitive traits, primate traits. Um, basically, Artipithecus has um, traits in the feet, in the knees, in the hips, that, and of course in the cranium that are fairly indicative of bipedalism, but also very, very much ape-like hands. Um, you can see very similar to what we see in chimpanzees, the limb proportions as well, and you can see that massive divergent big toe. So a combination of kind of both uh, uh, quadri or sorry, arboreal traits, but also bipedal traits. And they, really the key things seem to be the hip joint here, um, and the knee joint as indicative of bipedalism. So I just wanted to show you um, what uh, the Artipithecus's foot looks like. Um, there's some great three-dimensional images that have been prepared. And if we look at just the foot, Artie's foot is definitely much closer to the genus Pan, which is chimpanzees, uh, versus uh, the genus Homo, which is us. So you can see again that very large divergent uh, big toe. Um, however, if Oh, I didn't have some other traits. I had some images of the hands, again, also very chimpanzee. And if we look at the hips, um, also uh, that's where we start to see some anatomical changes, shifts suggestive, more suggestive, more indic indicative of bipedalism. Again, what this is then comparing is potentially Artipithecus's place in hominoids, so ape evolution. So we have an earlier split between gorillas and chimpanzees. Uh, then we have this shared, again, common last common ancestor or chimpanzee last common ancestor. Uh, splitting off into uh, the genus Pan or the chimpanzees and then the genus Artipithecus and then uh, Artipithecus would be one of um, our direct ancestors again but again with a lot more retention of those ancestral traits. Uh, with the Australopithecines this is probably one of our best known group of early hominins very wide ranging in dates including overlapping with members of our own genus um, and there's some key traits here that uh, Australopithecus is very clearly bipedal. Again, still have some retention in the upper limbs, particularly in the hands and the shoulder and the arms that are much more ape-like, but we're gonna see continued changes, particularly in the hips or the pelvis and the legs and the femur that are more suggestive of, again, habitual or obligate bipedalism. So again, useful to have some AP traits to access those arboreal resources, particularly for things like safety, as well retreating up into the trees, but spending much more time on the ground um, than other apes are. And uh, what's interesting is that with the Australopith fossil record, we have not only their remains, but we also have footprint sites such as Latoli, Tanzania, that clearly show uh, a human-like bipedal gait in terms of the heel-toe strength. So we have changes in the foot as well. Much less divergent big toe looks much less like this. Uh, the big toe is more 
in line. We divide them into two big groups based on basically how gracile they are, basically how much more subtle their features are versus robust, so robust think big. Um, and we think that the robust line, which some have argued should be a separate genus of Paranthropus, um, is, is kind of like, again, one of these evolutionary diet uh, dead ends, that simply they became too specialized in terms of their diet. Their teeth are really big, really robust. They have these massive jaws. Um, they have these bony crusts because of the massive muscles that are required for chewing. Um, and simply they just kind of didn't persist the same way that the gray cell once did. And it's likely that one of the members of the gray cell Australopithecines, one of these species, is directly ancestral to the genus Homo and therefore to us. So in the slides, I provide a, a bunch of background information. And so the key thing that I want you to look at then is some of the key distinctions between them. And we'll look at some of their fossil skulls um, or casts in our lecture that will allow you to examine some of these traits. So again, our earliest Australopithecus is uh, one of the gray soft forms, Anamensis. Um, one of the big things that you'll notice is that there is a distinction between those that come from the east, uh, eastern Africa and those come, that come from southern Africa. But we go on a lot more about that in, in the implications of that in biological anthropology or 209. So don't worry about both that in too much class, but just know. So we have the Australopithecus in 4.2 overlapping with Artipithecus um, in East Africa, again, with a mosaic of these ape-like and hominin-like traits. Afarensis is one of the best known hominins. Several examples, including the very famous, nearly complete Lucy. So we can talk a little bit more about her. Um, and again, one of the key things that we see with Lucy is a very human-like um, hip um, joint in particular, suggesting upright posture, bipedal locomotion, uh, but very ape-like arm. Uh, we also have not only um, examples of sex individuals, so Lucy's uh, pelvis is indicative of a female, uh, but we also have uh, specimens like the Dakika child uh, showing uh, development and what children would have looked like and infants would have looked like uh, for this species. And again, when we look at these reproductions, we see that they still look very apey. It's not until we get to the genus Homo that they start to look a bit more like us. Um, Afarensis is likely responsible for the Latoli footprints, uh, where we have basically the walking path of at least uh, two adults and one juvenile. It's been suggested potentially sexual dimorphism because of the foot size of the two footprints, but the juvenile footprint is clearly like that. Um, and again, the uh, heel-toe strike, the lack of the divergent or the less divergent big toe, and the gait overall is fairly indicative of bipedalism. So with Australopithecines, uh, we're pretty confident that bipedalism is present. Uh, another gray cell uh, form, one of the actual first uh, members of Australopithecus ever to be recovered is that of Africanus that comes from South Africa, several sites in the region. Uh, one of the differences between Africanus and some of the other Australopiths is that its dentition is much more human-like, so very small. Um, one of the potential candidates uh, for a direct descendant of the genus Homo is Sediba. Um, Sediba is not as well known as some of the other gray cell Australopithecines because it's a fairly new uh, fossil find uh, recovered in the last 10 years. Here, um, again, it's been argued it potentially is a descendant of Africanus, again, another South African species, uh, but again, has much more uh, human-like characteristics, particularly if you look at the face, it's starting to look a lot less ape-like, um, seeing a greater reduction even in the face, because with smaller teeth, we get a smaller uh, jaw, so we don't have that kind of projecting or what we call prognathic face, and so we have more of an upright face. Um, and then what's going to happen with the genus Homo is we're going to start seeing expansion of the cranial bulb to in, uh, incorporate that larger brain size. The rest of the Australopithecines are fairly fragmentary. So, for example, in Chad, we have Barwa Ghazali, uh, which is, again, one of the first hominins found outside of the East African Rift Valley. We also have Salanthropus. Again, it's questionable whether that's a hominin or not. And we simply have this partial fragmentary jaw. So it's amazing what we can tell from just a couple of teeth. Uh, we have Garhi as well. Again, it's very similar to some of the other Australopithecines, but it's definitely not. So again, how similar does something have to be before we can branch it off and say it's a separate species? Uh, again, is this reflecting just a range of variation within Australopithecus, uh, a very specific regional adaptation? These are the questions we're attempting to answer. Then we get into the robust Australopithecines. And again, what you can see here that's really characteristic of them are these uh, crests or these bony ridges. Uh, crests or ridges and bone represent muscle attachment areas. So we have really thick muscles that are attaching to the top of the skull here, uh, reflecting these massive teeth that they have. Ethiopicus um, is probably the most hyper-robust. Uh, and again, you'll see this cast, the specific cast in the skull, really, really just giant teeth. 
producing a very dish shaped face and massive prognathism to accommodate them. Uh, Boise eye is another example. Again, here you can see the reconstructed jaw, just massive jaws, massive teeth. Uh, again, this is suggesting an adaptation to eating things like hard nuts and tubers um, versus other Australopiths probably were having a more generalized diet um, as reflected by their more generalized dentition. Uh, interesting, we see with some of the Australopiths, the robust ones in particular, is very pronounced sexual dimorphism. So again, the male are significantly larger than the females in body size. And, and this is, again, a, mu a much more ancestral pattern for primates than it is for um, anatomically modern humans. Our degree of sexual dimorphism is like 10% difference between males and females, so very minor compared to, uh, to other primates, other living primates and other sexually dimorphic species. Yeah, robustus is another example. This one's from South Africa. Uh, robustus is fairly interesting, however, because it persisted as recently as a million years ago. So again, quite a few hominins overlapping with each other running around in East Africa and South Africa. Um, and potentially uh, some of these, including uh, Robustus and Boisei, uh, were some of the earliest uh, tool makers in the region as well. Uh, so again, this is just showing you another example of the overlap between uh, Ardipithecus with the Australopithecines. And then critically importantly here, uh, note that some of these later Australopithecines overlap with members of the genus Homo. And this is really interesting to us as paleoanthropologists because uh, now we're the only remaining hominin. We're the only ones left. And that's fairly unique because for the majority of hominin evolution, there's been other contemporaneous species present. Yes, there may only be one genus that's present, but there's several species overlapping and interacting with each other and coming into contact with each other. So um, what is it um, about us that's allowed us to be successful? Um, but also what are some of the, the, the concerns we might have that variation in our, in our genus has been reduced to a single species. So in the next video, we're going to be talking about the genus Homo. Uh, but one thing I want you to consider is uh, this question is why might there be so many Australopithecines? Um, again, what is the source of the variation that we're seeing in them? Um, should we have as many species we have or are they just representing again, gradual kind of microevolutionary changes within a species over time in response to different environmental conditions. So we're going to talk um, a little bit of more about this in the context of uh, the evolution of our genus, of the genus Homo, when we consider now the climate of the Pleistocene. So remember that climate played a key factor in the rise and the abundance of Miocene apes, right? Um, in the Pleistocene, uh, we see some significant climatic uh, fluctuations, particularly a uh, glacial period, um, that essentially we have a cooling that occurs. And so this cooling likely led to a shift in the reduction of uh, forest environments, greater uh, terrestrial grassland environments, um, and therefore we might have um, been more successful because of our ability to adapt to life outside of the trees versus our other primate relatives. So we'll talk about this um, a little bit more. And again, in the next video, we'll look specifically at uh, members of our genus, the genus Homo, um, as we continue on this path down towards us, anatomically modern humans.